Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for in, uh, giving me this opportunity to read five interesting papers and uh, to be a discussant. And, you know, it's already 10 past five, so I try to make it short so that you have more time to question and answer. Okay. Uh, well, this is a, uh, the panel on detecting uh, electoral fraud, but uh, I found that this is a pa uh, pa panel for the papers about anything. <laughs> it's sort of a mysterious uh, um, the panel. But I really enjoy you know, all of these papers. You know, I literally, uh, you know, I'm saying uh, each, I really enjoy each paper, and each paper is, I think is very well uh, written. But uh, as in the last session, it's very difficult for me to give you know, very systematic, synthetic uh, comments. So I, ex I give some comments one by one. Okay, the, the, the first paper, Shane and a Vickery paper, uh, this, is, this paper uh, is to propose new methodology for uh, examining, you know, in your world, possible challenges to electoral integrity. And uh, it's very, very informative and, uh, and uh, uh, it's a very interesting paper. But uh, as a political scientist, uh, very interested in uh, statistical methods, uh, you know, the first question I have is the measurement. Uh, um, the measurement issues um, in the in the paper that uh, that you wrote uh, on page six that assessment assessment was conducted by three senior practitioners. Okay, the data are really really rich, quantitative, qualitative, uh, sec primary and secondary source data, but uh, the the paper doesn't clearly explain how these rich rich pieces of information became. The, the ratings. What's the, the black box, you know, connecting the rich data and output? So uh, I would like to know more about uh, the, the measurement process, and I, I would like to see uh, your discussion about reliability, validity, and if possible, uh, whether or not the, the entire measurement exercise can be replicable, okay? And, uh, and also, uh, it, the, the main part of this paper is more qualitative assessment, and that part is really interesting. But uh, it also has for each element, you have some numbers. Mm -hmm. But wh why did you quantify? <laughs> you know, the qualitative information is rich. Okay, how do you use those quantitative numbers? Maybe, maybe you, in, you intend to repeat this process again and again and again in the same country so that you can see the change. Right, so um, that may be the reason, but I, I would like to, more, to, know, to know more about how you use those quantified numbers, okay? And also, my big concern is that you used those three uh, senior uh, practitioners who know uh, politics uh, in Afghanistan. But uh, are they making some sub subjective uh, assessment? Well, of course, they are making some sub subjective assessment, but <laughs> I'm kind of skeptical. Okay. And if you want to repeat this again and again and again, you need to, to introduce certain system that so that you can, your coding is systematic. Okay. And then I thought maybe, maybe you can use some kind of a machine learning technique. Okay. Uh, I think uh, that, um, as you mentioned in your paper, that uh, the some ways of you, some, we may be able to use some uh, cutting edge uh, text analysis. So uh, one method I was just thinking is, you know, those let the machine learn how those three practitioners coded the big materials and then turn those big uh, rich data into the, to the, the, the coding output, okay? And then as long as the machine can learn okay, uh, the, the coding process inside the head, then uh, in the next year, you don't need assessors. You know, you just need to get the, get the good, big, big data and then let machine to do the coding. Okay, then you can guarantee that the coding method is consistent okay, uh, in, in coming years. But that's just one idea. Okay, the second paper, uh, Lehok and Kolev, I'm not sure, I'm, not, I'm pronouncing maybe inappropriately, sorry, but uh, it's also a very interesting paper. Election, it states that election quality is worse under plurality system than uh, proportional representative system. And uh, it's a nice design, and I really like the design uh, the paper that focuses on cross-national analysis and also intra-country variation. That's really nice, nice combination. Uh, but uh, the, maybe this is still a paper in progress, but uh, the, the theory part is a bit weak. Uh, I, don't, I don't quite understand why uh, election quality is worse under plurality system than uh, proportional represent representation system. The, the studies of uh, corruption, um, 
my understanding of the literature is that uh, they tend to focus not just on plurality or vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, proportional representation system, but uh, there are two main factors, uh, two important factors that motivate corruption. One is intra-party competition rather than inter-party competition. Okay. The second one is the closeness of ele elections. When the election is really close, then corruption and electoral fraud tend to be higher. So uh, maybe, if possible, these two variables should be taken into account in your statistical analysis. And also, the, maybe the third thing is the district size. Okay, this is actually uh, that all of these uh, elements are what we discussed in our paper. Uh, I wrote with the Kentaro of promoting APSR in 2011. But uh, if the size of the district is really small, I mean, meaning, meaning that if the number of votes a winner needs to get, to win a seat is really small, and typically in local elections, but also in the national elections under certain electoral systems, then corruption and electoral fraud tend to go up. Okay, so that's uh, uh, and a more general methodological comment, comment. Of course, uh, the main treatment variable uh, electoral formula is obviously not random assignment, so we can always discuss, you know, uh, endogeneity and other things. And I was thinking maybe you can focus on one or two countries that change the electoral formula. Okay, from uh, uh, the P PR to uh, plurality or plurality to uh, to uh, the PR. Okay, and then they, there maybe there are not many countries. Okay, so the treated units may be small, right? But uh, then then maybe you can use. I'm not sure you know this methodology, but uh, uh, some recent uh, statisticians and uh, political scientists proposed a new method called the synthetic control method. Because you have a time series data, you can focus on one specific country that changed the electoral formula, and then statistically simulate synthetic that country, and then see that see that see, see, examine the trajectories of uh, quality index over time, and then see whether there is a divergence after the electoral system change. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that may be another uh, way to do some estimation. The third paper. Uh, EMB uh, can learn lessons from an aid agency and an industri insurance industry. Okay, and again, this is a really rich paper, and it's very insightful, easy to read, um, and um, good paper. But uh, I still think uh, I just uh, well, my this is my my question. But uh, uh, can we really learn lessons from different organizations, non-election actors? Uh, maybe yes. But maybe no, because there are some uh, major differences. One is uh, elections are not everyday events. Okay, so at least, for example, in my country, Japan, uh, those who work for uh, EMB are not necessarily fully uh, full time employed persons, part time, some some uh, temporary, uh, even voluntary, so on. The organization, the nature of organization itself is also different. And the second major difference between election organizations and non-election organizations, uh, in elections organizations, they need to pay attention to the competitors. Okay? After a particular day, <laughs> losers and winners are defined. Okay? So that doesn't happen in, the, in, the, uh, in uh, 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 the aid agency and also in the insurance industry, right? And then, so the, whether or not the EMB can be neutral uh, in this entire administration process is a big issue, but that's not the big issue, I think, uh, in the other non-election actors. Okay, and I, I, was, I, I, have, I actually have a, a friend who works for the Australian Taxation Office, and uh, he, he is in a team detecting fraud, and a, a team of statisticians and data scientists. And a, and a computer science, and they apply many, many different techniques. So he said that the Benfors law is just one of them. There are many, many new uh, interesting technologies. So I was just wondering, um, if we want to learn techniques from you know, other the, uh, organizations, maybe we can you know, look at some, some of those cutting edge technologies that the other organizations are using. Uh, the fourth paper, a field randomized experiment to detect electoral fraud. Uh, this is a really, really good paper. I like it so much. And uh, I hope, uh, well, this paper definitely uh, can be published uh, from a top journal, I assume. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't have much uh, negative comments. But uh, one thing is um, you emphasize in the paper that you are the first to do a field uh, randomized experiment to detect electoral fraud. No? no. No. Okay. Yeah, but I, 
I that's at least maybe my, maybe I didn't read carefully, but I that, that that's the image I got. But I, obviously, you know, each each Naomi, each you know, and many other people are doing mm -hmm. the random experiment, right? So um, uh, um, so uh, maybe maybe you can compare uh, uh, what other randomized field experiments are done, and uh, how how your ex experiments are uh, you know significantly different from the others. Okay, maybe you mentioned in your presentation compliance. Is, is an issue, right? That's true, but at least in other, you know, uh, field experiments like, like Naomi uh, Ichino, I think she she left, but has done in, in those experiments. At least you can estimate ITT. Okay, if you can estimate in some ways compliance rate, you can also estimate the co compliant average causal effect. But so that's a bit technical issue. But uh, other than that, you know, I think uh, this is really really good paper. One small issue. Um, uh, is uh, in the in the the first two sentences in abstract and also in the first sentence or two in the in, in uh, conclusion, you talk about really really big thing. Okay, the first sentence in the first sentence you say you mention nuclear disarmament, climate change, human right. Okay, these issues are indeed important, and a democracy and a democratic governance may matter, of course, to to. Uh, in, in you know addressing these pro uh, big problems, but uh, there is a huge gap between the really big issue you mentioned at the beginning and also the specific research design uh, you are working on. So, just a minor thing, but that's a small concern. The last paper, um, uh, uh, I. I I person I like natural experiments, uh, and I always seek in some as if random natural, as if random situations. I really enjoy your paper, and it's great that you know um, uh, you found this in interesting natural experiment, right? And uh, again, uh, I, I think uh, well, I also like this paper so much, and uh, not much uh, many uh, negative comments, but uh, one um, small methodological comment uh, is. Your dependent variable is actually compositional, okay? So the, the percentage of abstention plus percentage vote for this party, percentage vote for that party, plus percentage vote for that party, plus percentage invalid vote, add up to 100%. Okay, so instead of running the regression separately, maybe maybe uh, better to do the so-called compositional data analysis, which is not that difficult, okay? But uh, then uh, you can see how the treatment change the distribution of those percentage. And then maybe you can graphically show these changes. And, that, and then that, that actually, you know, by you know, having a constraint, okay, 100%, you may be able to see some different uh, uh, effects uh, in your uh, main coefficients. Okay? The, the big question which we briefly discussed before this session with coffee uh, is the, the uniform distribution, okay? uh, the last digit. So why not? The second digit, third digit. Why are you focus on the last last digit? Which that was not clear. And also, I saw clear devi a deviation from the uniform distribution. But what does it mean? Okay. What are the mechanisms of these deviations? Okay. I would like to know some concrete examples or anecdotes or rumors or what what bad things people there are doing, so that this kind of strange data digit patterns of well, you know. So combi combination of uh, cutting edge statistical methods together with a rich uh, in-depth explanation of the cases, I think uh, will uh, improve your paper. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, so this is for the paper presented by uh, James Long uh, on the about the paper presented by James Long, the PDFs that they circulated seemed to only have your slides, not the paper. So I didn't have a chance to even glance at the paper. But that said, I was basically totally unconvinced by the bar charts where you had the photographs because of the endogeneity problem. You, it's the second order treatment thing. And it sounds like you've solved that in some way, but that would be very important. Uh, and the initial regression that preceded that, uh, not all of those coefficients looked like they were significant or even close to meaningful, even though your presentation kind of talked like they were. Um, the north included thing seems to make a difference, and I didn't understand what that was going on there. So apparently, if you had the paper, it's not quite as mysterious, and maybe you've solved it. Mm -hmm. But as, as was presented here, I just didn't, basically didn't believe a lot of it.
Well, it's a big pack. Paper. It's a very big pack, so. <laughs> I don't want to hold that paper, so he gets Hi, um, Michael McNulty with NDI, um, also to James Long's paper. Um, I just want to say from the practitioner's perspective, it's exciting um, work that, that's been done both in Afghanistan and Uganda um, and has spurred some ideas about how um, impact evaluation can be done of trained observer uh, observation as well. So it's exciting work you're doing and encourage you to keep going with it. Um, it's one thing I would encourage you to think about is the, uh, the missing tally issue. To maybe think about disaggregating the type of fraud, maybe using IFAS typology or another typology. Um, missing tallies could be fraud. They could be malpractice that you know they weren't trained to do it correctly, or that the impunity in the system is just such that they don't feel they have to, even if they get a letter. Um, so just thinking more about you know is that fraud or is that something else? It certainly indicates a problem of some sort, but maybe making the claim that it's reducing fraud might be the wrong sort of typology in that particular instance. The reduction of vote count for Museveni in, in the other cases seems to be more plausible as fraud in that case. Um, and then just also to acknowledge the um, domestic observation, in some cases methodologies that attempt to address some of the challenges you mentioned, um, you know, deploying observers to you know, randomized polling stations, collecting data systematically, um, and, and other methods and challenges that you mentioned. Um, I think the sample-based observation methodology that's been applied in, in many countries um, does get at some of those issues. Um, again, it's, it's, it's important that it's implemented consistently, but uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that and not lump all observation together. So, a couple comments. Yeah, hello, my name is Michael Liedauer. I'm uh, at the Goethe University Frankfurt, but I also used to work as election observer with several organizations in the past, and I also would like to comment on James's uh, paper. Uh, I was very appreciative of the fact that you actually were referring to different observation methodologies and different practices in the field, but at the same time, I thought uh, you could better take uh, into consideration that there are domestic and international observation organizations who do think very thoroughly about their methodology and how long and where they should be in the field and so forth. I also think that election observation is not only about deterring fraud uh, or detecting fraud, it's also about instilling trust, about providing recommendations and that list could be continued. So I think if you build your argument about uh, using something else with the use of technology on the fact that you want to replace the item of deterring fraud by observers, I think that's, that's too narrow. Um, I also don't think that the two things would be mutually exclusive. I think especially domestic observers do already make use of different kind of modern technologies in their work and uh, that could be combined. Um, but um, uh, most importantly, I wanted to make a comment and uh, pose a question on the letter that you were using. I had a look at it now and I, my feeling when I see that letter, I feel that it's quite intrusive. Yeah, uh, especially the first letter that mentions the fine yeah, sounds a little bit like uh, a threat. And I wonder how the Ugandan EMB has reacted to your proposal of using this methodology and also how you relate this to your uh, adherence or a reflection of the International Declaration and the uh, Code of Conduct. Thank you. Yes, just related to that, it follows up on that. I was wondering how you managed to get this through an IRB when you're putting all these people in danger by taking photographs of potential fraud. Did you go through the IRB process? And, of course. And They're not doing anything different that any Ugandan can't do and does do. It's perfectly legal to take photographs of tallies. And in fact, they encourage that. The EMB encourages that. So they're not in no, any citizen has access to a tally to take photographs of, of what they're doing. And they're encouraged to do that. To, I mean, candidates always want to, and party officials always consult those tallies because they want to see sort of what the local result was. But citizens consult them all the time and are able to take photos. 